Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Bobby. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is June 2nd, 1988. My home group is the underground group. We meet at the Old Pine Community Center on the corner of 4th and Lombard in South Philadelphia on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 o'clock. If you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop by. To ha- uh, we'd love to have you. Can everybody hear me? If not, oh, good. Okay. And it's uh, for your clock watchers, it's 5 of 5. <laughs> Chapter 5 uh, gives me the directions what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to tell you in a general way what my life was like as an active alcoholic. What happened to me and what my life is like as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, you had a couple of my friends down. You had uh, Robbie a couple of years ago, Robbie from Jersey, then you had Peter from New York. And I'm always, you know, there must be something about us up north that either you like what we say or the way we say it. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but I actually spoke to Robbie a couple hours ago, and I spoke to Peter yesterday before I came down, and they both told me to say hi. And, you know, so it's always good to be here. And so uh, this is it. I was born and raised in a very blue-collar, very ethnic neighborhood in Philadelphia. I got seven brothers and sisters. We had no booze all in my house. My father did not drink, and my mother could not drink. My mother was pregnant for ten and a half years. (laughs) She was. There is eight of us within a ten and a half year span. I am 11 months older than my sister. I have a sister who is 11 months older than me. Really, eight of us, uh, Irish octuplets. <laughs> so besides being pregnant for ten and a half years, my mother also had a history of mental illness and abuse prescription medication, and my father, who did not drink, was smart enough not to have any booze in the house. But my grandparents lived around the corner from us, and that's where all the, their basement was finished as a bar, and that's where all the family functions were held, the graduations, the christenings, the confirmations, and that's where I had my very first drink. I didn't get drunk the first time I drank, but I remember what it was. It was Ballantine beer. And Ballantyne used to sponsor the Phillies. And I remember going up to Connie Mac Stadium with my father, that old scoreboard in right center field with the three rings. And I was run, bun, running around the basement bar polishing off the half empties. Or the half fulls, I guess it depends on your perception. And my uncles were pointing at me, said, look at him, look at Bobby. See, I never felt a part of, and that's pretty tough to do when you got, uh, you know, ten people living in a small three-bedroom row home. But I never felt a part of. And that would be true even into early recovery. You know, and uh, there was always a party, you know, and my father was one of 13, my mother was from a much smaller family, she was one of 11, and, <laughs> and I had tons of cousins, and there was always a Christian, and there was always a confirmation, and my grandparents, both sets of my grandparents were immigrants, and uh, these were my father's parents who lived around the corner from us, and so my, they talked kind of funny, you know, and... Uh, so the kids in the neighborhood used to make fun of them, but I think if you come to the neighborhood and listen to most of their grandparents, they kind of spoke funny too. But, you know, I loved my grandparents. I loved the music. I loved the atmosphere. And I could not wait till I get older so I can uh, participate in uh, all the fun they were having. My drinking really took off in high school. Most of the kids from my neighborhood went to the local diocesan in high school. But my parents had sent me to a private Jesuit high school. And right away I felt kind of different. Because most of the kids who went to the school were from affluent families from the suburbs. Just me and a couple of the dirt balls in the neighborhood got sent to this school. And my parents had made a great deal of sacrifice to send my brothers and sisters to private school. Again, because they were both uh, children of immigrants and they knew the only way to make it in this country was by education. So right away I felt kind of different. You know, we used to walk to this school. And the, a lot of these kids, like I said, it was their first introduction to the inner city. So their parents were dropping them off in their luxury automobiles. And me and the guys from the neighborhood were inside robbing their lockers. Now, I knew that was wrong. I knew that by their values instilled in me by the nuns as a kid and by my parents as a kid. But I had a lot of nicknames, and one of those nicknames was Crazy Coil. And I would do things in my gut I knew was wrong, but I did it anyway because you came to expect it, you know. And we did all types of crazy things. Like uh, we saw football pools, and if you hit, we didn't pay off. Like what were you going to do? And then they kept buying them off us, you know. We, uh, if you want to buy a particular substance, we would sell you a substitute, you know. <laughs> we went more, we went through more oregano than a pizzeria. It was unbelievable. I mean, we thought we were gangsters. We were just nitwits. That's all we were, you know. 
But I remember my freshman year at the prep, it's a uh, football season, there was an away game, there, we rented a bus, there was drinking, there was fighting, there was police activity. It was really a lot of fun. And I remember my first day back to school, the disciplinarian had us outside the office, and there were about ten of us outside the office, and they were all up a classroom, and just me and another kid from the neighborhood, we're the only two freshmen. And I remember he made a beeline, he came right up to us, he said, what are you with you guys? You guys here like two weeks, and you're getting this jackpot already? And I just shrugged my shoulders, I said, you know, father, just one of them things. And what it was, that'd be the story of my life. I didn't play football, so I didn't hang out with those kids. Even though I did well academically, I didn't hang out with the AP kids because they were a bit weird. I was there about a week and a half. I found out who the nitwits were, and that's who I went to hang out with. And that would be the story of my life. Every time in a new situation, who the nitwits, I'm with you. I'm right there. And I didn't distinguish myself there, but I didn't do badly either. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by. wasn't making the dean's list, but I wasn't failing out, you know. And uh, mediocrity was my goal, and I would be okay with that for the next number of years. That's I just want to lay low. I remember the school. Now, the school sits in North Philadelphia. It's a pretty rough neighborhood. It sits on the corner of 17th and Gerard. Three blocks away is the subway. Now, at the end of the day, a lot of these kids would take public transportation home to the suburbs. So they would wait for the trolley car, the trolley stop outside the school, take them three blocks to walk to the subway, because they were scared to walk those three blocks. Well, two blocks away on the corner of 15th and Gerard sat a bar called the Ebony Showcase Lounge. And when I was a junior, I was a regular at the Ebony. And I went there for a couple of different reasons. One, they had cold beer. Two, they had dancers. And three, though, me and the guys in the neighborhood, we would always stroll out that street and sit in that bar and show how the tough we were to the, uh, to the kids in the suburbs. I'm not a tough guy. I never was. And every time I strolled out that street and I walked in that bar, I was terrified. But I didn't want anybody else to know, you know, playing the role. I, mean, I was a legend in my own mind. And as you can tell by the name of the establishment, I wasn't from the neighborhood. And I'm what? I'm what? I'm like 17, 16, 17 years old. I look like I'm 12. I'm, I'm dressed like I am now, like blazer, slacks, and tie. But they figured if we were goofy enough to walk into the bar, they'd be crazy enough to serve us. And it was just nuts, you know. When it came time to graduate from the prep, I really had no desire to further my education. And that kind of ticked my parents off because they made a great deal of sacrifice to send my brothers and sisters to private school. So I know I couldn't stay home because there'll be hell to catch. I don't like to catch hell. Love to create it. Don't like to catch it. My options are limited. I'm 17 years old. I got no money. I got no skills. What am I going to do? So the only thing that I thought was available to me was the military, and I enlisted in the service. That really wasn't a bright move back then. The military wasn't popular at the time. It's the 70s, and uh, but I went in, and uh, when I got done, I went through all types of training, and then I wound up getting sent overseas for 13 months, and that's when my drinking really took off. I never messed around with other substances in my life. I never even smoked a joint. I know a lot of guys in the neighborhood who had gone over and got whacked on certain things. I had a fear. I had a fear of other substances. But I had a drinking problem before I went in, and the drinking just escalated while I was over there. I was there a couple months, and several good friends of mine got killed, and I didn't know how to handle that. Because in my family, we didn't talk about nothing. It was all surface stuff, you know. And once you moved out of the house, whether you went away to school or you got married, you were no longer privy to the secrets of the family. Everything stayed within the walls of the house, and everything stayed inside you. And once you moved out, that was it. And that's not a shot on my folks or my family. That's just the way it was. We didn't talk about none, you know. So when my friends got killed, I don't know how to handle that. But booze numbed the pain, and that's what I did. I drank to numb the pain. And I didn't distinguish myself in the service either, but I didn't get any jackpots. Given the bare minimum effort required to get by, I wanted to do my job. That was it, you know. Uh, hope you didn't even notice me. When my tour was up, I came home, I, uh, I enrolled in school, I went to St. Joe's, and I wound up taking a couple civil service exams. And I remember at St. Joe's, and back then, it's still a small school, but back then it was smaller. I don't, don't think there was more than 3,000 of us, you know, 15, 20 of us in a classroom. And I remember it was the end of spring semester. And it's the same thing. I'm not making the dean's list, but I'm not failing out either, given the bare minimum effort required to get by. And then like before, a kid from the neighborhood called me up. He said, Bobby, the Phillies are playing tomorrow. It's one of those businessman specials, you know, like one of those weekday afternoon games. They said, you wanted to go to the game? I said, sure. They're not going to miss me in the classroom. I'm not an active participant. So I go to the Phillies game. The Phillies have since moved. They're playing at Vet Stadium down in South Philadelphia. And it's at the, young, at the end of the semester. It's May, and it's an unusually warm day in Philadelphia. And me and four guys from the neighborhood, we're at the top of the 700 level. We're drinking that cheap watered down beer. And one of the guys I was with, I turned to these guys and said, you know what, I said, I'm going to run down in the field and meet one of the players. And they kind of shrugged me off because another nickname I had was Bullshit Bob. 
I used to tell these wonderful stories. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I did that. I didn't do nothing. I sat on the bar stool and made stories up. I talked to you, I should have started off once upon a time. That's what I did. I just told stories. But I had my work, I worked my way down to the, I had this picnic areas in the left field and the right field corners. I worked my down, uh, worked my way down to one of those areas. And I, sn- I jumped over the fence and I ran out. And I'm telling you, before I know it, I'm in center field. And I'm running, a- running across the field. And um, the San Diego Padres were in town. And Dave Winfield was the right fielder for the Padres. And I went out and I shook his hand. I said, hey, Dave, how you doing? <laughs> and he looked at me. He said, brother, what are you doing out here? And he's a pretty big dude, right? And from behind him, I saw the guards coming. I said, Dave, I got to go now. So I start running towards the infield. I want to slide into second base. I don't know why. I just thought that'd be cool. I just thought that'd be cool. So as I was running towards the infield, there was more guards coming from the third base side, and I knew I couldn't do that. If I slid in the second, I'd get caught. So I start going towards first base. And I'm as close probably to Dennis and I are right now. Like, I'm going to give myself up. There was guards coming from the first. I'm walking. I'm about to give myself up. And then I deke the guys, and I ran in the outfield. Now I'm running around like a screwball. It seems like 10 minutes, but it's closer to two or three, right? But you know what? I got these, the guards, they're young guys, young, short, fat guys. They're all tripping over each other. They couldn't catch me. They look like Keystone Cops. I swear to God. Up on the scoreboard, they put Mr. Excitement. Uh, I swear. I'm running around. I'm joking, jiving. But you know what? I got nowhere to go. The fence is 12 feet high. I'm drunk. I'm out of breath. I'm about to get sick. Where am I going to go? So I finally stopped running. I'm waiting out in the center field, waiting for them to come grab me. They come take me off the field. I, st- I swear to God, I got a standing ovation from 37,000 people. I swear to God. <laughs> so Tug McGraw was in the bullpen for the Phillies. He gave me the thumbs up. Like, right, I go. You know? Now, I knew I was going to get a beating from these guards because I made them look so stupid. They could have beat on me all day long because you know why? I figured by the time I get out of jail, I'd be a hero. I actually pictured this. Walking into the bar. Now, see, that'd be the type of story that I'd make up. Bullshit Bob, right? But I had them four guys from the neighborhood. I figured, you know, they could put up the bail money, but I'd be back in the neighborhood before anyone. And I, I could drink for free off the story for at least a week. I thought that. Just as I was about to get my beat, and the Philadelphia police lieutenant showed up. He said, what's the matter with you? He said, are you drunk? Are you high? I said, no, I'm just happy. Just happy to be here. He said, well, you better get your happy ass out of the stadium. So not only did he save me from getting a beaten, but he saved me from getting arrested. And that was important. Because one of them civil service exams kind of panned out about six weeks later. And I got hired by the Philadelphia Police Department. (laughs) They were hiring anybody back then. I tell that story for a couple different reasons. One, it's the only funny story I got. I wasn't a funny guy. I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't a lover. I was none of that stuff. I was a lying, thieving, stinking, falling down, violent, drunk. And if I hung around you, you had something I wanted. I used and abused everybody I came in contact with. I had good times, but believe me, when I crossed that line, I wasn't aware of it. I don't know when it happened, the date, the year, but it got ugly quickly for me. Secondly, it's a true story. I got them four guys from the neighborhood. They can back me up. And thirdly, and more importantly, it's really the only one of the few stories I actually remember. I remember when I eventually got sober, I was at the VA hospital, and the doctor came up to me. He said, listen, do you ever have any blackouts? I said, no. I must have answered too quickly for him. He said, do you know what they are? I said, nope. <laughs> Once he described them, I said, all the time. <laughs> That's why I thought you had a good load. If you couldn't remember it the night before, you know, I remember walking through the neighborhood. I'm looking for my car. I can't find it. And I see other guys are doing the same things. And we're like, yo, you see Mike? I'll give you a call. You call me. I said, I didn't remember nothing. I swear, I would, I would show up in the corner the very next day, and guys would be telling me stories, the stunts I pulled the night before, and two or three hours later, I'd be repeating those stories like I had memory of myself. I was a blackout drinker from the very first start, you know. So I get hired by the police department. I'm not even old enough to drink. The drinking age in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has always been 21. The drinking age at that time in Jersey was 18. And where I lived in Philly, I'm across the river in Jersey, quicker than I could be other parts of Philadelphia. But once I got, uh, we had a mayor at the time when I got hired. His name was Frank Rizzo. Frank was a former cop, police commissioner. He loved us. We could do no wrong. 
We were 8,300 strong. Well, that's what we were just known, a gang with badges. That's all we were. And I remember when he swore us in, we're holding our credentials. He said, gentlemen, in your hand, you're holding the ticket to the best show in town. And he wasn't lying. So I no longer had to go over to Jersey. The badge opened the door for me. My first 10 years, I spent more Philadelphia, where I would see the ravages of alcoholism, drug addiction, day in, day out. And at the end of the tour, I would go out with guys of the squad and drink it. And I saw things on the job that bothered me, but I couldn't tell my co-workers that because I didn't want to be thought less than. I wanted to be one of the boys, to the point where I engaged in behaviors in my gut I knew was wrong. I was uncomfortable doing it, the way I talked and treated people, but I did it to be accepted by my, my co-workers. And it was ugly. The handwriting was on the wall quickly. It was, I'm the last guy to figure it out, but that's the way that works. I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. I first got introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1979. I don't tell people I went out because I never came in, but I'll tell you what happened. I showed up at work one day, and my co-worker, he was drunk. He was out of his mind. And on our job, we had a counseling unit, a peer support group, and then they had EAP group, and then they had an AA meeting that was attached to that. And I showed up at work one day, and this dude was out of his mind. And, the, and the, the, my supervisor said, take this guy up to the unit. He's going to be detailed there for the day. I says, okay. And I had this guy in the back of my car coming down the driveway, and this little house is sat in a park. And uh, there was a guy sitting on the porch, sitting on the swing. I can still picture him. Uh, and he actually, we worked out of the same building, Eddie. He was the turnkey downstairs, and I knew him. And I pulled up. I said, Eddie, I'm dropping this guy off. He's detailed here for the day. I'll be back at 4 o'clock to pick him up. He looked me dead in the eye. He says, kid, do you want to come in? I says, no, I don't. I was insulted that he even asked me. Because I know what alcoholics were. Alcoholics were you older guys. You married guys, you guys are the three heads. I mean, guys who disappear. And back then, you couldn't go do treatment four, five, six months, guys that disappear. I said, I don't want to come. Nah. I was insulted and even asked me. And when I got sober a few years later, he was one of the first guys I saw when I got out. And I remember I walked into the meeting. He was sitting there with his arms crossed, and he smiled at me. He said, so, kid, you finally came around. Which just goes to show you that all the drinking and all the nonsense that went with it were necessary for me to hit my bottom. I was at work one day, and my immediate supervisor pulled me off to the side. He said, you know what, kid? You're smart, and you're going to go places, but that booze is going to mess you up. In one ear and out the other. I'm at a family function one time. My uncle was there. My uncle, he was a boss in the job. He pulled me off to the side. He said, Bobby, I'm hearing stories about you. You're going to get yourself in a jackpot. You better take it easy. In one ear and out the other. Several years later, on two separate occasions, I ran into my uncle and that supervisor in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I realized at that point that they were trying to 12-step me. And I remember talking to my uncle. I said, I said, how come you didn't tell me? You know, he gave me one of them old-timer smiles. He said, Bobby, you just weren't ready yet. Again, just goes to show you that all the drinking and all the nonsense that went with it were necessary for me to hit my bottom. I was 24 years old, and I shot and killed a 15-year-old kid in, in a situation that could not be avoided. You know, uh, they now have a phrase, suicide by police, but 25, 30-some years ago, that wasn't around. And I use that, like, I, I use that as an excuse to crawl in a bottle. And that's what I did for my next three years. I wound up getting sober when I was 27. Drinking took me to a lot of my nevers, and one of those nevers was the use of other substances. I wound up getting promoted and moved on my job, and I'm working in this particular unit, and, uh... I'm in bars drinking. So I'm, I'm not hanging in the back of churches due to the crowd I'm trying to work with, you know. So uh, so I'm drinking so my judgment was impaired. And I'm put in a position where I thought I needed to do other substances, and that's when I did. And I got involved in other substances. My drug history is very short. It only lasted 17 months. It caused me and a lot of other people a lot of problems. And out of respect of the fifth tradition, that's why I need to talk about that stuff. So please feel free to use your imagination. You know, it was just nuts, you know. I'm sitting home from work one day, and I'm reading the Daily News, and there's an article in the paper. At the end of the article, there's a phone number, and there's a series of questions. It says, alcohol problems, drug problems, depression, marital problems, thoughts of suicide. I'm four out of five because I'm single. I'm sure if I was married, I'm a bat in a thousand. And they talk about the moment of clarity. As soon as it came, it quickly left. But something made me cut that ad out, and I stuck it in my wallet, and I continued on drinking. It was 1988, Memorial Day weekend, 1988. I'm sitting in this bar, guys I worked with. We're in some trouble. So I get into the bar. We go to get our stories together. That's the purpose. Turns out to be just another party, and we're drinking, and we're doing other things, and just we're off to the races, you know, just nuts. And one of the guys I was with decided that he wanted to go home for some reason. God forbid, take care of some sort of family obligation. And I decided that I would give him a ride home because I did not think that I was as drunk as he was. 
and he thought that was a pretty good idea. So I get in the car, uh, and I'm, I'm a show off. I'm an arrogant guy. There was, I got a lot of, I'm aggressive on the job. There's a lot of press. And just in case you happen to miss it, I had a few articles in my car. I'd be more than happy to autograph for you if you were interested. So I want to show off my driving skills to my coworker. It's okay. It's not my car that I'm driving. It's, you know, these city cars. And I would see things on television or in the movies. I said, I could do that. I wrecked so many cars. I remember when the AID guys would come up to me, and I, I should have started once upon a time. I would tell these stories, and they would just look at me. They knew where I was lying, but the thing about a lie, you got to stick it out. I mean, if you want to lie, stick it out. Don't change. You get Tell it till you believe it, you know, and that's what I would do. And they knew I was lying, but I just, you know, what are you going to do? And that's right. I lied about it. I was just nuts, just nuts. So I'm going to show off my driving skills to my co-worker. So I'm driving up this narrow one-way street, and towards the left side, of my, on my left-hand side, is a big stone wall about 10, 12 feet high. Kid riding towards me on a bicycle. I was going to play chicken with this kid. I thought it would be funny for him to see to jump the curb and grab the wall. Again, I don't know why. I just thought that would be funny. Unfortunately, at the last second, we turned the same direction. I ran this kid over. As he lie bleeding on the hood of my car, got out of my car with my nightstick and was going to beat this kid because I thought he was milking me and, and or the city for an insurance claim. So the guy that I was with prevented me from hitting him anymore. So I took this kid off the hood of my car, threw him off the side of the street like a piece of trash. I pulled this crumpled bicycle from underneath my car, threw that over the side of the street like a piece of trash. Drove back to the bar, made some sort of smart alcohol remark, and I continued on drinking. When I came to it the next day, I realized I was in serious, serious trouble, but I didn't think any, any, anybody would help me because I was such a creep. And believe me, I was a creep. I really was. I didn't know what to do. So what I did do, I got a bottle of liquor, a case of beer, some other substances, and I checked into a, to, uh, to a hotel with the intention to consume all this stuff to build up the courage in my life. And three days later, all the alcohol and all the other stuff is gone. And they knock on the door to kick me out, you know. I only paid for three days. And uh, I, I was just a mess, you know. At this point, I'm suspended from my job. I no longer have access to my weapons, so I couldn't shoot myself. So what I did, I walked over to the window. I opened up the window. I was going to jump out the window. I opened up the window. I was on the fifth floor. I remembered I was scared of heights. I made 23 jumps in the service. I never overcame my fear of heights. So I went in the bathroom. I filled the bathtub up with water and had a blow dryer. I was going to pull the blow dryer into the tub to make it appear an accidental electrocution. But every time I would pull, pull the blow dryer into the tub, it would come unplugged. I was about a foot and a half short on cord. And I and I got one foot in the tub, I'm leaning trying to plug it in. And it's like that scene out of that Woody Allen movie where he couldn't even kill himself, you know. And it's okay to laugh, but I never want to forget the pain I was in that day. So the only other tool that I had left was my car. So I took one last spin through the neighborhood. I started up the Falls Bridge, and I come down, and that's a very, on the East River Drive, which is a very winding road along the Schuylkill River. And my intent was to go on, go on to oncoming traffic to end my life. And this was like a week, mid-weekday, Wednesday, Thursday, mid-morning, about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And that would be important because if it was any other time of the day, I would probably succeed at what I set out to do because it's a heavily traveled road. And the speed limit is 20, 25. I'm doing about 50. I'm cooked. I'm hungover. I'm whacked, you know. And I'm coming down the drive, and I'm flying. I'm probably doing about 50. And I handled enough jobs like this, head-on collisions at a certain rate of speed usually does the trick. Then I had flashed back on something that happened to me when I was younger. I was like 22, 23 years old. And I had to do a notification. I knocked on this guy's door. I had to tell him that his son was killed in an automobile accident. And this will always haunted me. And I don't know why. I mean, it's not even my top 50 of, of, of stuff that I experienced, you know. And to me, he was an older guy. Everything's relative. I mean, back then, I'm 22, 23. He had to be late 30s, early 40s. And I remember when he opened the door and I had told him that his son got killed. I, I pictured it just like yesterday, and it's 25 years ago, easy. He slumped against the door, and I asked, the only way I can describe it is I actually saw the life leave this guy's, I just saw the life leave this guy's eyes, you know. I was in court a couple weeks later, I didn't even recognize it. I'm walking down the hallway, he stopped me. He looked like an old man, he looked like, like he was in his 50s. <laughs> Back then, like I said, everything's all right. He looked like 50s or 60s, I couldn't believe it, I didn't recognize the guy. As much pain that I was in that day, there was no way that I could inflict this type of damage on an innocent family. I now know that was the grace of God, and I, Larry spoke so eloquently about grace today. That was not my intent. 
I, I now know that God was looking out after me, but that's, believe me, that was through no, no virtue of my own there. But something, God, not something, God, He prevented me from doing that. But I still was in, I was still in pain, and I knew I needed that in my life. So I decided I would wrap myself around one of these big old trees we got on the drive. And you hit those trees at a certain rate of speed, that usually does the trick. Usually splits the car in half, and if you're not belted, then you usually get ejected from the vehicle and struck by another vehicle, and that usually does the trick. That would end your life. And then I just lost it. I just started crying, you know. And I'm surprised that I didn't go in an accident because I had no control over my emotions at all, like I'm flying along. And I pulled over at the end of the East River Drive, it's Boathouse Row. And I throw my car up on the sidewalk. And I sat behind the wheel of my car and I cried like a baby for about ten minutes. And I reached into my glove box where I always had an extra gun. You always needed one of them. And it wasn't there, but inside the glove box was my wallet. And inside that wallet was the article that I had clipped out of Daily News about six weeks before. And this is no longer there, but at the end of the last, uh, the last uh, boathouse was one of those old glass enclosed phone booths. And I walked over and I dialed that phone number up on that piece of paper. And the woman who answered the phone, I spoke to this lady like I spoke to no one in my life before. I told her the truth. I told her everything that was going on in my sad, miserable, pathetic life. And God bless her, she listened patiently. And when I got done talking to her, she said, Listen, why don't you drive over to Hahnemann Hospital, somebody waiting to talk to you. And it was like about a five-minute ride. And they were waiting for me. And they admitted me to the 10th floor of the psychiatric unit. And they kept me there for about three or four days. It got me kind of stabilized. And from there, I got transferred to the VA hospital out in West Philadelphia, where I would spend about six weeks on their flight deck. And from there, I got transferred to another VA hospital out in Coatesville, where I would spend another few weeks on their flight deck before I got put into an alcohol and drug ward. When I pulled over that day and made that phone call, Alcoholics Anonymous was the furthest thing from my mind. I didn't believe I had a problem with alcohol. I was a beer drinker. There was no way that you could be an alcoholic drinking beer. I thought it really was my short use of other substances. If I left that crap alone, I'd be okay. Maybe this is mental illness. I inherited this from my mother. Maybe it's this stress stuff they're now talking about. I got this from an experience in the service. I got this experience in the job. Maybe it's the neighborhood I live in. But it can't be alcohol because I'm a beer drinker. There's no way you could be an alcoholic drinking beer. Alcoholics were these poor people I was dealing them with day in, day out. I mean, I drank beer. The only time I drank hard liquor was like on St. Patty's Day or New Year's Day or payday. But I was a beer drinker. I was just nuts. And beer's not booze. I mean, that's how nuts it is. Yeah. I know no differently, but, you know. So I'm in the VA hospital out in Coatesville. I finally get put in the alcohol and drug ward. At this week, i am probably been in different nut woods probably for about maybe 10 weeks. So I finally get put in the alcohol and drug ward, which is pretty cool because they have handles on both sides of the door. So now I'm going to get the lay of the land. And it's amazing how quickly the arrogance creeps back in, you know. So I'm scouting and getting the lay of the land. I wander into the day room. And in the day room, up on the, wall, the big wall, they had the large window shades of the 12 steps of the 12 traditions. And I zip through those steps. I get about six of them done. I see the amends. They're screwed. Not my neighborhood. No amends. We don't do that. No amends, that's on you, that's the way it is. But later that night, two men came up. I would like to find out that they were part of the treatment facility committee. I did not know that then. They came up to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The moment that the speaker said something about his background that I could not identify with, did not relate to, I just didn't like it, I immediately tuned him out. I was too busy listening to the messenger, not the message. Now I started looking around my peers, and I realized I was probably a little hasty in seeking some sort of assistance for my drinking. I'm looking around my guys, my guys in the community, and I realize I'm not as bad as these guys. Most of these guys had wives who hated them, kids they couldn't see, you know, PFA, stay away orders. I didn't have that. Probably due to the fact that I'd never been married. I didn't have any kids. May had something to do with that. A lot of these guys had legal problems. I didn't have any legal problems. Probably due to the fact that I had a gold shield in my back pocket. A lot of these guys had employment jobs. They couldn't, they, uh, employment issues, couldn't even hold jobs. I only had two jobs in my life. I went from high school to the Air Force to the police department. Never worked for anybody else. No, no employment problems for me. See, I was too busy looking for the, the differences and not the similarities, you know, and just how whacked I was. But what bothered me the most, without any question, was at the end of the meeting, when everyone got in a circle and held hands and said the Lord's Prayer. If this is what you people are about, I don't want nothing to do with you. Because I hated God. And I know they're strong words, but that doesn't even begin to sum up the feeling I had. And believe me, they were all legitimate reasons why I hated God. And one of the more important reasons I hated God was, 
I talk about my mom's mental illness. And my mom was like in the fundamentalists in the church, you know, and she thought she could speak in tongues and there were pictures and candles and all that stuff throughout the house. And I was 15 years old. I came home from school one day. I'm the only guy in the house, you know, and I wander around about 10, 15 minutes. And I come across my mother. My mother had slid her wrist. And I remember she looked up at me. She said, Bob, me, help me. I looked at her. I said, good for you. And I walked out of the house. And I got an older guy to go to the state store and get a bottle of wine. I stayed down and drank the wine. And I came home later that night. My father told me what happened. I acted surprised. I said, oh, yeah, how about that? So that happened when I was 15. I got sober when I was 27. That's 12 years of hating God. And it would be a few more years before I would even address this issue. And believe me, 12 years is a good hate to get that churning. So I wasn't holding hands. I wasn't saying no prayers. When it came time to get out of the hospital, I'm about to say this, and please, it's not to get a joke. A nurse came up to me. She had to be a member of al -Anon. She was just a beautiful lady. And she saw all through my BS. It was all facade. And she said, the only way you're going to make it, you're going to need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I need to tell you that's the best piece of advice I got. And that's where I would get my recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't get it at the VA hospital. The VA hospital helped me tremendously. You know, they, they do great work there. You know, they drain the oil. They tighten the bolts. They helped me tremendously. But I got my recovery in AA. And I went to AA every single day, sometimes two or three times a day, depending what shift I was working, you know. I don't drink coffee. I've never had in my life, so I don't make it. I don't smoke cigarettes. I've never had in my life, so I ain't emptying any ashtrays. I walk into a big book meeting or step meeting that was strictly by accident. I would leave it to break. I had something more important to do. Tradition meetings. Rules. My line of work, we love to enforce them. We don't like to follow them. They're for other people. That's what I think about tradition. I was interested in war stories. And in a moment that the speaker said something about his background that I could not identify with, I didn't like or didn't, I, you know, I just didn't like, I, I would immediately tune him out. Too busy listening to the messenger, not the message. But I made meetings. I was a meeting maker. And I was crazy as a bed bug. I was just nuts. I did everything wrong you could do in Alcoholics Anonymous. The only thing I didn't do, I didn't pick up a drink. I'm sober 11 months. I'm sitting in this bar because they sold real good roast beef. Great roast beef. That's what I tell you, you know, 20 years ago, that's what I tell you. The truth is, the reason I was in that bar, because during my early career, I'm getting a lot of press. You know, as you can imagine, towards the end of my drinking, a lot of my behaviors uh, generated some negative publicity. The reason I was in, my, in that bar that day, I said, don't believe the hype. I don't know who that dude was. Mistaken identity. I'm back. Things are cool. That's why I was in that bar. Arrogance. I'm in the bar. A couple guys from the neighborhood, they come in and they just start busting my, you know, um, breaking my shoes. You know, give me a hard way to go. And they, I understood. They thought it they was necessary to knock me down a couple of pegs, you know. And unfortunately, one of the guys got just a little too close to me. And I'm drinking seltzer out of a rock glass. And I stood up and I punched him right in the face with the glass. And I dropped him. I opened him up. He bled like a pig. And I remember the wagon crew came in hand to the job. I knew one of the guys on the wagon crew, and he pulled me off to the side. He wanted to hear my side of the story, and I told him what happened. And I can still picture the look of disgust in his eyes. He said, you're nuts. You better get the hell out of here. And I got out of there. I mean, I could have got pinched. I mean, that's a serious, serious charge there. And that's where I learned my lessons about people, places, and things. And I have since found a place that sells real good roast beef without being in that type of environment. And if you ever come to Philadelphia, I'd love to have you. I promise I won't be punching anybody. But that's how nuts I was, you know. My one-year anniversary came, and my home group at that, that time, you would tell your story for your anniversary. And it was amazing. I got done speaking, thunderous applause, the blind could see the lame walk. It was truly miraculous. People came up and patted me in the back and said, Bobby, you're doing so good. I lied during my entire story. I identified myself as an alcoholic because of my home group. That's all you could talk about. I didn't believe I was an alcoholic. I thought my problem was the short use of other substances. If I left that crap alone, I'd be okay. Maybe I got this mental illness. I inherited this from my mother. Maybe I got this stress. I got this from the job. I got this from the service. It can't be alcohol. In fact, during the course of my story, a bottle of beer appeared in my head. But you guys don't want to hear that. You want to hear all the quotes, and I gave you all the quotes. And you came up, and you patted me in the back when I got done speaking and said, Bobby, you're doing so good. And I was dying inside. I need to back up for a moment. The very first meeting, the first outside meeting I went I went into this meeting, and there was a guy, uh, there was a husband and wife speaking. They both had 10 years. The wife had one more day than her husband, and she constantly reminded him of that throughout her story, how she had one more day. 
Ten years, that's, come on. I don't believe that. Maybe you go over in Jersey and drink and keep your Pennsylvania time. I don't know. Come on. <laughs> Ten years, I, I can't believe that. There was a dude from my neighborhood whose nickname was Troubles. That's a hard-earned nickname. You get a nickname Troubles. And he was in and out of jail in the 60s and 70s. And, he, I, and I was shocked to see him because I had not seen him in years. I actually thought he was either dead or in jail. And here he is in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he's sober a couple years. And I see him in the meetings. I said, damn. I need to tell you, that's the only reason I came back to AA. I said, because it could work for him. I mean, this dude was nuts. It worked for me. That's the only reason I came back. I was just nuts. I was sober 23 months. I beat another man with a baseball bat. Forget what step I was working that day. <laughs> I was nuts. I swear to God. Stone cold sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous as a liar, thief, and a cheat. I was a creep with the new woman. I used to go to a lot of gentlemen's clubs, right? I drank soda, so that was cool. Drank soda. I'd get my picture taken with the entertainer, right? And come to the meeting and pass the picture around to the old timer, because I know you guys would like that. The pi they would look at the picture, and they would look at me, and they would shake their head and say, please, kid, please keep coming back. And I thought they'd be facetious. I said, all right, I'll keep coming back. I was just nuts. My second anniversary came, I went to eat my gun. The same pathetic feeling I had, well, excuse me, my second anniversary came, I didn't celebrate it. It was my, one month after my second anniversary. 25 months sober, making regular attendance at meetings in rooms of alcoholics and anonymous, I wanted to eat my gun. The same pathetic feeling I had 25 months before, but 25 months before I'm loaded with drugs and alcohol. Here I am, stone cold sober, I want to eat my gun. Safe to assume my life was unmanageable. I hated everybody, but you know what I hated the most? I hated the newcomer. I know everyone says they're the most important person in the room. Not for me. I hated them. I'll tell you why. There it goes. I was in uh, my home group. We had a, fr a court board. First name, last initial, date of the month. How many years you're celebrating? Anniversary board. If Joey A had three years and Bobby C had two and Joey A went out, I said, good, he's out. I'm in. Everyone's talking about how much time you got. I thought the seniority would meant something. I mean, that's how nuts I was. So I'm, I'm sober. So now I'm sober two years, and now if you tell me you got ten years, I says, all right, I've known you two, you said you got ten, I'll spot you the other eight, I believe you. But you know what? I hated, I hated the new guys coming in behind me, because these guys came in, and they were rambling idiots. I mean, they were just knots that, you know, spit on themselves. I mean, they were just terrible looking. And I saw these guys get better in front of my eyes. I hated them the most. Where's mine? Flat out refused to take you know what, at the end of the meeting, back home, we all go to the diners. There's like a diner on every corner besides a tap room, you know. And they would come up to me and say, Bobby, we're going to the diner. You want to go? I said, nope. God forbid they never asked me, though. I mean, you had to run me over to get out of the room. I'd be standing there, Bobby, we're going to the diner. You want to go? I said, nope. <laughs> no, I never went, but I got mad if they never asked me. I mean, that's how nuts I was. It was crazy. One night, I'm at, uh, Friday night, I go to me. I tell you, I always made meetings. But the worst meeting to go, you know, I, I'm on the meeting Friday night. So where the hell's everybody at? Half the group is missing. On their Saturday, the same thing. Half the group is missing. Sunday night. Oh, here they go. They were all away on the retreat. I'm telling you, the worst time to go to a meeting is Sunday night after retreat. They all come floating in and, you know, they've all seen the light and they're all glowing and floating. I said, oh, Christ, I, you know. I never left a meeting. That's probably the only decent thing I ever did in early recovery. And I would just sit in these guys, and I just hated these guys, you know. And the truth is, you know what? I know I'm making fun of them. They were good men. They put the hand of AA out time after time after time, and I'm the one who slapped it away. One time after a meeting, they came up and they tricked me. The way you trick a newcomer is you don't give them a chance to formulate the lie. They come up to me. They say, Bobby, are you working this weekend? I only I, I only had seven weekends off a year. That was it. Six on, two off. And so every seven weekends, I'd get a weekend off. I'd get a three-day weekend. And I was off this particular weekend. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not working. And I couldn't believe it. I knew it was the wrong, wrong answer. They said, good, because we're going on retreat this weekend, and we're going to take you with us. I said, oh, Christ, I don't want to go. So it's a Friday afternoon. They drove me in the back seat of a car, a big side on each side of me. It's road reversal because at work I drive and you're in the back seat. So here I am. I got a big guy and I'm in the back seat and we're driving up to this retreat house Friday afternoon. 
And the truth is, they were good men, and I knew that I was safe. But I couldn't tell them about my mom. See, they knew that I had a problem with God. What were they going to think about me if I told them what happened to my mom and why I really hated God? You know, I was sober two years in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was sober long enough knowing that you could not get kicked out of AA. But I was also sober long enough to always know that not everyone is always greeted as warmly as the next person for one reason or the other. Just my experience, you know. So the closer we get to the retreat house, the bigger the knot my stomach gets. So we get there, it's like a Friday afternoon, it's like a 4.30, 5 o'clock. And they say, Bobby, we want to introduce you to the, to the retreat mayor. She said, all right, come on, let's get this over with. They take me down this long carpeted hallway, they knock on this door, the guy says, come in, I come in. He stands out of his chair and he puts his arms out, he wants to hug me. He's my disciplinarian from high school. <laughs> and not only that, but he's also a long-time member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he comes off to me, he says, you know, he wants the 411, you know, how am I doing, where I'm going to meeting sponsor, things like that. So I'm giving him the dirt, letting him know that what's going on. He said, that's great, he said, that's fantastic. He said, by the way, who's your sponsor? I said, I don't have one, Father. See, he knew I was a pretty smart guy. He says, I strongly suggest you get a sponsor. So he asked me, my roommate, to be my sponsor. God forbid, should I ever be questioned again, who's your sponsor? There, there he goes, right there, that's my sponsor. I never called this guy. You know, I, the only time I talked to him is when I accidentally bumped to him in the meetings. He would wave to me and say, Bobby, I still get that same phone number. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a call. I never called this guy. You know what I used to do? I used to tell other people, you know, that dude's weird. You won't believe what he wants me to do. He wants me to do this. He wants me to do that. He didn't do nothing. I made it up. He put the hand of AA out there. I slapped it away. Then I character assassinated the guy that boat. That's how nuts I was. A month after my second anniversary, I go to a Friday night meeting, and Troubles is there. And I go up to him after the meeting, and I could, Bobby, I because that was his name. He didn't like to be called Troubles, and he had he could be called whatever he wanted to be called because he was a rough dude. <laughs> I go up to him. I said, Bobby, I said I need some help. I said, Would you be my sponsor? He looked me dead in the eye. He said, Bobby, I've been watching you these past couple years, and I'm sticking my chest out. I said, Yeah, he kind of likes me. He says, I need to tell you. He said, you're full of shit. That's not the response I'm looking for. <laughs> he says, I'm going to be your sponsor under certain conditions. Hey, you're going to call me every single day. You're going to go to a big book meeting a week. You're going to go to a step meeting. You're going to go to a men's meeting. You're going to get yourself a coffee commitment. And you're going to leave them damn well alone. And I'm talking to myself. Who's he talking to? I'm sober 25 months. I'm selling the grapevines. I got it going on. But what I did do, I looked him dead in the eye and said, that's okay, that's what I'm willing to do. <laughs> so he took me back to his house. He introduced me to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He kind of used some colorful language. He told me that I didn't know nothing. I should just shut up and listen. And that's what I needed to do. I mean, I, everybody else I was running circles around. I needed a guy like this. The cop in the con. It was unbelievable. <laughs> so... He, uh, he introduced me to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He kind of used some colorful language. He just told me to shut up and listen. And we went over the first two steps, and the only time I responded was when he asked me a question. And then the third step, we got together, and we got on our knees and said the third step prayer. And I'm, I, I need to tell you, I'm uncomfortable with this, you know. I'm uncomfortable praying. I'm uncomfortable getting on my knees with another guy. You know, this ain't happening, you know. But you know what? The truth was, this, he was a rough dude at one time. He really was. He wasn't carrying himself like that anymore. It wasn't in the rooms of AA where anybody can sound good. I saw him in the neighborhood where the other 22 and a half hours where he was walking the walk. And I just knew that I was safe with this guy. So I get on my knees. I said to pray with him. And then when we got done, he said, good. He said, Bobby, the way we do a third step, we pick paper and pen and do a first step. I said, whoa, whoa. Easy does it. <laughs> so let's keep this simple. You know, and you know what, the slogans, I'm making fun of them, but the fact is the slogans, uh, they have an appropriate purpose. I just use them as an excuse to not do any work. But I don't want to do one of these inventories. I mean, I'm going to meetings and people say, oh, doing this four step, stirring stuff up, I feel like going out. I want to eat my gun. You can't get no further out than that. So I do my first step, not a big deal. Everything I wrote down, I did. It took me a couple months because by nature I'm somewhat of a lazy guy. Pain's a real good motivator. You know, when my back was against the wall, I would kick it out for a couple hours. All the times I sit in my drawer. So it took me a couple of months to get it done. The fifth step, that's the big one. 
But I'm a smart guy. I got this figured out. I called my sponsor. I said, Bobby, I'm going to retreat this week. I'm going to do that fish set with the priest. He said, that's great. When you get done, stop by my house so you can do it with me. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you're on your phone with your sponsor. You feel like saying, you're deaf. Do you hear what I said? But before I could say something flippant, he told me, he said, Bobby, I'm your sponsor. This is a journey. The next two steps have to do with character defect. And if, I can, if I'm going to help you with them, I have to know what they are even though I have a good idea. And he hung up on me. <laughs> now the truth is, the reason I want to do my fist with the priest, it was not to be spiritually lightened. I hate God. I hate the church. I got it on the list. The, the, the resentment's still there. It wasn't to be spiritually lightened. There were other things and other parts of my inventory that I was embarrassed about. And I was afraid if I would tell my sponsor, he would ridicule me, he would pass judgment, or even worse, he would betray the confidence and disclose what I told him. He would tell others. Which kind of tells you my fearless isn't quite done. I never did that fist step with the priest. I did that fist step with my sponsor, and they turned out to be unfounded fears because he did none of those things. He didn't pay his judgment. He didn't ridicule me. And to the best of my knowledge, he never told anybody else what I told him. In fact, when we got done, when I got done, he shared some of his experience with me which took away the terminal uniqueness in which I was the only guy to experience certain things. See, he had taken someone's life and had gone to prison for that in the 60s. That's not why I asked him to be my sponsor. I said earlier, I asked him to be my sponsor because he was carrying himself in the neighborhoods. It wasn't the rooms of AA. It was in the neighborhoods where he was carrying himself as a gentleman. He had female friends because he treated them with dignity and respect. He didn't use any profanity. I'm telling you, he was a big dude. He was a, you could take a look at him and tell that he was someone not to be messed with. But he didn't carry himself like that. He was truly a gentleman. That's why I asked him to be my sponsor. And I was forever grateful for him sharing because I knew that about his past, but we have never discussed that. And when he shared his experience with me, it took away the terminal uniqueness in which I thought I was the only guy in the world who have done certain things. And I'll be forever grateful for him doing that. When we got done my fifth step, we didn't burn my fourth step because he told me I would need this for the rest of the steps. Six and seven, character defects. I didn't know what these were before I did my inventory. I knew when I drank I was a character. I found out when I did my inventory that I had no character at all. I thought I was the greatest cop in the city, you know. Truth was, I had no integrity whatsoever. Because the type of work that I did, I worked with co-workers who did that type of work without doing drugs, you know. I justified it as the thought I needed, that's what I needed to do. But I worked with men and women who served with integrity and didn't do that stuff. I thought I was the greatest uncle in the world because I was single, I had lots of money, I took care of my nephews and nieces. It turned out that I wasn't a great uncle. I was a rotten brother and a horrible son. And that, you know what? To be honest, I wasn't invited to key family functions towards the end of my drinking because I was an idiot. I remember my sister, my older sister. I love my sister. We're extremely close today. But I'm at my sister's wedding. This is 8081, the punk rock days. I, I'm not a punk rocker. Love dating them, though. They're a lot of fun, right? <laughs> so I go to my sister's wedding. The girl I go with me, she's wearing like a leopard mini skirt, you know. Not wedding entire, but man, she looked awesome. And my uncles liked it. They, they, they were checking her out. So we go there. We get to church. We're late. We're there late. And I mean, we're both. We're three sheets of the wind. We get there. The service started. We slide in the last pew. We don't want to cause a scene, right? At the end of the service, my sister's walking down the aisle. Our eyes meet. I could see the disappointment and hurt in her eyes. My father's behind her. He has a different look in his eyes. <laughs> so I tell, I tell my girl, I said, you know what? I said, they're, they're going for pictures. It's probably a good thing we don't go. Why don't we go get a couple drinks? Reception will slide in. Not a big deal. No one will notice. That we're gone. She thought that was a good idea. So uh, we go to the bar. We get, we get hammered, and we show up at the reception. And uh, it's almost like that, like a Southwest Airlines commercial. You know how you want to get away? I bring her in. They got this thing where the servers put their big tray on where it has all the other dinners on it. And she trips over this thing and knocks like eight dinners to the, uh, and it makes all this noise and 300 people at the hall turn around and look at us. And it was, my sister wanted to crawl under a table. She was so embarrassed. Here it is. I love my sister. Here it is the happiest day of her life. But I'm selfish and self-centered to the scream and I ruin it by, my, by being an idiot for being drunk, you know? I tell people I didn't have a spiritual awakening. I had a rude awakening. I had this stuff. I had this in black and white. I mean, I had a certain image of myself, and that's why we write this stuff, crap down. I got it in black and white. I was an idiot, you know? The A-step, you know, I used to be one of these guys. I never harmed anybody but myself. 
that should have been a tip off. I never did my inventory. Because once I did my inventory, I found out I harmed everybody I came in contact with. And unfortunately for me, those closest to me the most were harmed the most. And because I didn't burn my four step, when I did five, half my eight step was done. And I had to draw more names down in there. And if I, you know, and if I, if I wasn't willing, I pray for the willingness, you know. That six and seven, that's all, six is, six is just a willing step. I was always taught if I ever have a problem with a particular step, you always fall back on the immediate past step. It will help you tremendously. The seven steps just a prayer. I got a laundry list of character defects. Let's say one of them is that sometimes I may not be the most patient guy in the world. And I could be all day long, God, help me be patient, help me be patient. But during the course of the day, should you cross my path and you try my patience and I lash out with sarcasm, which is nothing but anger, also referred to as language of the Irish, if I lash out in sarcasm, that prayer for patience goes out the window. You know, so the eighth step I had half of it done. I had to throw more names down there. The ninth step direct amends. No letters, no phone calls from me, because you know why? Because I didn't beat you with the bat or rob you through the mail or over the phone. And every whenever, whenever I want to pick a pen up, I mean, I can tell you lots of reasons, but the truth is, if I'm really honest, I'm afraid to face you. You know, so I'd like to share two experiences on the ninth step. I'm at this meeting 17, maybe 18 years ago. I'm at this meeting. This guy walks down the steps. I have not seen this guy since 1977. He's not through any fear, just plain forgot. They say more will be revealed. He walked down the steps. I recognize this guy. I used to like fighting big guys. I don't know why. I wasn't good at it, but I'd like to do it. I like people. People would say, he has heart. I got two shiners, but they say, he got heart. I was just nuts, right? So this guy was a big guy, and I was in a bar one day, and we had words, and for some reason, he backed down. So from that point on, whenever I wanted to impress people how tough or nuts I was, I would publicly humiliate this guy. And like I said, I'm not a tough guy. I never was. So it was like the verbal taunts, you know? And then one day I slapped him with an open hand. He didn't do nothing. And then one day I spat upon him. I'm in the other degradation of spitting on another human being. It doesn't get any lower than that. He did nothing. He walked down the steps. I'm sitting at the table. He didn't recognize me. He had a seat. He sat like in the second row with that young lady as he sat there. I stood up when I got time to introduce, or when I got introduced, I stood up. I looked this guy dead in the eye. He said, my name is Bobby Cool. I'm an alcoholic. Now, I need to take a quick moment here and tell you why I use my full name. I know there's traditions. They're, I know they're top secret. God forbid. We're not even going to mention the concepts, but these traditions are top secret. They're misunderstood. No more so than this 11th tradition. All of a sudden, we get sober. It's like we join the mafia. You know, everyone gets a nickname. You know, there's John the Brick and Jimmy the Coat and Frank the Fox and Pepsi George and Bucktooth Mary and Wedge Fred or Jerry and, and everyone. Everyone gets a nickname, you know. I don't want no one to know that I'm a, in AA. Everybody in my neighborhood knows I'm a stark, raving, lunatic, drunk. There's those little telltale signs. They come outside to catch me. I'm urinating in their car. My girlfriend throw the clothes out the window. I'm a nut. Everyone knows I'm a nut. But God forbid my reputation should be tarnished by going Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> you know, the 11th tradition is real clear. Personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and film. That means you will never see my face clearly identified, followed by my full name, which is Robert Ignatius Benedict Coyle III. I know. Followed by the statement, is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You won't see me on the television, you won't see me in the paper, and you won't hear that on the radio. That's a violation of the 11th tradition. Sometimes, though, I know we see celebrities on TV and they say, I'm in recovery. That's not a violation. People say, I'm sober. That's not a violation either. It is when they are clearly identified and say they are a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's an anonymity break. God forbid, 3 o'clock in the morning, you feel like drinking. I'm calling information. Yeah, I'd like to have Frank the Fox's phone number. Can I have that? <laughs> or if you want to go visit one of these beloved old-timers, yeah, I'm here to see John the Brick. I mean, you're not going to get in. <laughs> they got a nut word to put you in, you know. Yeah, I'm here to see Jimmy the Coat. Jimmy the Coat here? <laughs> it's just nuts. You got Bucktooth Mary's phone number? I mean, come on, man. It's just Dr. Bob and the good old timers said, when one drunk is anonymous from another drunk, that's a violation of the 11th tradition. He went on to say that anonymity is spiritually inspired and secrecy is feared inspired. This is not a secret society. I was very involved in the area back home where we use our full names. It's really important. I mean, you're not going to find Bobby the Cop in the phone book. 
You will find Robert Ignatius Coyle the third. I dropped Benedict. It's back in vogue, but I dropped it. <laughs> but you will find Robert Ignatius Coyle the third. I mean, you know, come on. So off that soapbox, I'm back to the meeting. I look this guy dead in the eye. I said, my name is Bobby Coyle. I'm an alcoholic. And he nodded. He recognized me. You know, we sober up. We clean up. Making amends is much more than saying, I'm sorry. For me, there are two words that don't mean squat. It's about righting the wrong. Financial amends are easy for me. I go in my pocket and pay you. Or if it's a large sum of money, I go in a payment plan. But I make sure that I pay you. But what about the emotional damage or the psychological damage? How do I make amends for that? I was told that I sit down and have conversations with people, explain my behavior, just in case they, they were not aware of it, which has never been my experience, but just, just in case. And but from that point on, you don't exhibit that behavior again. And then I resume those roles I'd given up before because drinking was more important. And now I become an honest employee. Now I become a son. I become a brother, an uncle, you know. So, but how do I make amends for this emotional damage to this guy? I figured if I publicly humiliate him, the most I could do was make amends to him publicly. It wasn't the grandstand. So I told the group what I used to do to him. And I turned to him. I said, Bob, as long, I'm truly sorry the way I treated you. And as long as I stay sober, I hope I never treat another human being the way I treated you. He came up and he hugged me. He forgave me. It was an incredible experience. So after the meeting, now we're talking. Now I had not seen this guy in years. This is 18 years ago, and I had not seen him since 77. And I said, Bob, I ain't seen you in years. How you doing? He said, Bobby, I'm sober. Three years in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I said, get out of here. Now the arrogance creeps in, because everybody in AA knows me in Philadelphia. I'm not saying that they like me, but they know me. I'm involved in service. So he comes in and says, I'm sober, three years. And I said, get out of here. And I live in South Philadelphia. This meeting we're at is in North Philadelphia. And where he lived was in Roxborough. It's like Northwest Philly. So he comes, uh, so we start talking. I said, man, what brings you here? Because this is the meeting we normally wouldn't go to, uh, neither of us. He said, Bobby, I was flipping through the meeting directory tonight, and I just want to go to a different meeting just to switch it up. And for some reason, this meeting just jumped out at me. Our meeting directory is 80 pages thick. We have 1,600 meetings a week in the city. And he said, for some reason, this meeting just jumped out at me. I am a firm believer that my God put that guy in my path, and I had two options. I could do what I did, or I do what I always do, which is. The nice thing about having eight siblings in a ten and a half year span, there was a close resemblance. And I would have people come up to me, say, I remember you, you said so best. Oh, you got me confused. You're talking about my brother Brian, my brother Sean, not me. You know, I know you're cool. I don't know which one you are. And you know, I had to make amends to my brothers, you know. So, but I did that and it was a, tr it was a tremendous relief, you know. Flip side of that, my home group was at the Stepping Stones group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Northeast Philadelphia. Sunday morning, I'm at a business meeting. I make a motion. It was definitely for the betterment of AA. It had to be since I made it. Unusual thing happened. My motion doesn't get seconded. Now, come on. Every motion in AA gets seconded for no other reason. You know it's not going to pass. You just feel sorry for the poor guy making them odds. That's a crazy-ass motion, but I'll second it. I know it ain't got a chance. Just, you know, even more of a reason, one of my boys is in the room, Freddie. We grew up together. I mean, I grew up in a neighborhood. We had certain rules. You may think they're still, but you know what? And everyone knows what the rules are. One, you always had your boys back. It didn't matter. You go out in the neighborhood and got and he got you beat up over it, right, wrong, or different. You always had your boys back. You and him can discuss that later. Secondly, you never dated anybody else's ex. So, oh, you know what? You're kind of cute, but you dated an auntie in the third grade. I can't talk to you. You just don't do that. It's a loyalty thing that you just don't do that to your friends. So I'm looking. I'm making eye contact with this guy. Like, I got this motion up, and I'm almost like going through fits. Like, you know, he stares dead at me, and he doesn't second my motion. My motion goes down in flames. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm at work one day, my co-worker who's sober, my co-worker comes up to me, he said, Bobby, Freddie Wheels is outside, want to take care of some sort of business. I peeked out the window, I saw him. I said, tell him to take his fat ass down to City Hall, he can't do that here. A couple weeks later, that same co-worker called me up, he said, Bobby, Freddie Wheels died last night. And the reason I'm calling you is because he always spoke so highly of you. As God is my judge, I cannot tell you what that motion was about, that's how petty it was. Here he was, was a friend of mine. He was put in my path many, many times. And here I am, a spiritual heavy hitter, and I was going to make amends when I thought it was ready. Put in my path many, many times. I would walk into the room, there would be five or six men there, and Freddie would be one of them. I would say hi to everyone and completely ignore him. 
He may have considered me a friend, but obviously my actions didn't indicate I felt the same way. And the moment that co-worker told me, Bobby, because you always spoke so highly of you, I felt about you big. And I've been praying for Freddie ever since. See, that key word in the ninth step is wherever possible. I also thought that said whenever possible. Whenever's time, wherever's place, and for me it's never the right time because I'm too busy, easy, doesn't it? Two experiences on the ninth step. One where I took the action, I reaped the rewards. The other where I had many, many opportunities and I chose not to take the action. I paid the price. The 10th step for me is nothing but 4 through 9 on a regular basis. Now if I'm going to stand up here and tell you I do a 10th step every day, that's not true. Sometimes I'm good. You know, 4, 5, 6, 7 times a week. Then there's other times, you know, try to stay sober in yesterday sobriety. 2, 3 times a week. And I used to say, if I'm not practicing these principles and on a daily basis, no one knows but me. That's not true either. See, if I'm not practicing these principles on a daily basis, I operate in nitwit mode. Should you cross my path in nitwit mode? You two are affected. <laughs> I remember a few years ago, you know, sometimes when I drive, I, I, I know I have a tough time. Sometimes I get like Tourette syndrome when I drive. You know, I just wake out every now and then. So it's a group anniversary. My job to go to the bakery, pick the bread up. So I go over to the bakery and some guy, he beat, I don't know why, but I, I kind of flipped him off and, you know. So later that night, I'm at the meeting. Carl comes up. Carl's like the most decent man I ever met. He's like, just a really decent guy, sober a long time, got the twinkle in his eye. You know, you guys got like guys like him down here. You're just a, a decent human being. He comes up to me. He says, Bobby, I was over throwing popular today. He said, I beeped and waved at you. He said, with a twinkle in his eye, he said, and you waved back. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I blush easy. I was so <laughs> Of all people to flip with this guy, I mean, this guy, he, he doesn't hear a profanity. He he's a decent man. Oh, just not. I, I, I went to crawl under a chair. I was so embarrassed. It just goes to show you I never get away with not. And I always thought I did, but I always got caught. You know, it's just nuts. The 11th step through prayer and meditation, I pray and meditate on a daily basis. I may not pray and meditate the way I was in doctrine as a kid, and that's okay. Up to this point, I've been giving you my experience. I'm about to give you my opinion. I don't believe you should ever give it from the, your opinion from the podium, but if you do, you ought to qualify it. This is my opinion. This is why I believe Alcoholics Anonymous is so successful, because you guys have given me the freedom to find a way to pray and meditate in which I am comfortable. Because I need to tell you, if there were only one way to pray and meditate, I would not be here today. Because what I bought into AA which I now know was a misdirected resentment towards God and religion. I no longer feel that way. But I felt like that way a little over 20 years ago. See, God wasn't the problem. The church wasn't the problem. The Air Force wasn't the problem. The police department wasn't the problem. My mom wasn't the problem. My mom was just a sick woman. and She does what tormented people do. I was the problem. Bobby Coyle. I was the problem long before I picked up a drink. You know, those feelings of inadequacies and insecurities. And believe me, I was the problem when I drank. But when I put the booze down, I was still the problem because I wasn't doing the right thing. You know, I never had the courage to do the right thing. I hid behind the badge. I hid behind the bottle. You know, so I pray and meditate. It took me a couple of years to try a couple of things. If you're in Irish, I'll tell you afterwards how I do, how I pray and meditate. I don't want to do it from the podium because I don't want to insult anybody because there may be somebody sitting here who has the same bias that I had when I first came in. But I pray and meditate the way I've been doing it. I've been doing it for a little over 10 years, and it gives me tremendous, tremendous energy. It gives me tremendous relief. You know, it, it's, it's just really powerful stuff. The 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening. I had that spiritual awakening. Again, just like Larry says, I haven't had any burning bushes, no lights, no burning lights, no uh, voices from above. In fact, it's been a number of years since I heard any voices at all. I'm truly grateful for that. <laughs> but I've had that change of attitude. But the most important, we tried to carry this message. See, I went through my evangelical stage when I got introduced to the big book, and I would quote it, and this is the only way to do it. If you're not doing it my way, you're doing it wrong, and when I get done, I backhand you with the book to make sure it's sunk in. I believe in the message of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe it's a tool to get recovery, to get uh, to recover. However, I was using it as a weapon, and there's a difference between the two. But more importantly, in the 12th step, is to practice these principles in all of our affairs. I'm only in an AA meeting an hour and a half a day. 
What about the other 22 and a half hours? What about the time on my job? What about the time in my neighborhood? I live in this really neat neighborhood. We have a strange phenomenon. Um, things tend to fall off the back of trucks a lot in my neighborhood. Everybody got a deal. You know, I tell you, sometimes you come to my men's meeting on Sunday morning, it seems like the only requirement for membership is to have a black leather jacket. It's like almost like a Sopranos casting call, you know, these guys. And everyone got an angle. You know, hey, I got yo, I got these TVs. He says, nah, no, nah, no thanks, you know. Because if I start justifying that, I can justify something else, you know. I make mistakes. I don't want to give you the, 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 uh, the perception that I'm the poster boy of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not. I make mistakes. You know what? Making mistakes is not going to get me drunk. It's the arrogance of defending those mistakes or not learning from those mistakes. That's what will get me drunk. I'm just a regular guy from the neighborhood who falls short on most days. But you know what? I can tell you this. I'm not intentionally harming people. I know I'm not using other people's credit cards. I know I'm not making pace to other guys' girlfriends or wives and all that slimy. I did some terrible things sober. I don't need to, under the influence, you can use your imagination. Stone cold sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous as a creep for my first couple of years. I did everything wrong, but I just didn't pick up a drink, you know. And but by for the grace of God, I stuck around long enough, and I waited for the miracle to happen. But a miracle happened because I took action. Time ain't got nothing to do with this. If you were new, I don't wish you well. I, I excuse me, I don't wish you luck. Luck ain't got nothing to do with it. I don't want you to think like uh, it's like sobriety is a big wheel and today's your day to drink. That's nonsense. I hear people say, oh, I did the 12 steps and still drank. That's nonsense. Nowhere in the 12 steps does it say uh, go out and buy a 40, go out and cop a bundle. It doesn't say that. <laughs> it's, uh, actually, there's a guarantee in our book that tells you when all else fails. What happens there? Uh, what can you do to not pick up a drink? Work or work with somebody else. That's the way it happens. I've been working that way since 1935, you know. I then got involved in the service, and I learned about the traditions. And I love the traditions. The traditions are to the group, but the steps are to the individuals. The steps are how it works, and the traditions are why it works, you know. And the 12th step takes many different forms and fashions, you know. The preamble says our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. If I'm only staying sober and not helping other alcoholics, that's half measures. And half measures are valid as nothing. It doesn't say how valid as something, how valid as half, how valid as nothing. That's why I give it away. We have a, a statement of responsibility. I am responsible for when anyone anywhere reaches out for help. For that, I want the hand of AA to be there, and for that, I'm responsible. I can't worry about you. I know what i got to do. I get upset when people say, oh, that service, that's about politics. Not my experience. My experience is in those involved in services, some of them are the most selfless people I've ever met. I'm sober a couple of years, right? My sponsor, Troubles, calls me up and wants to take me to a prison commitment. I ain't going there. I got nothing in common with these guys. I thought I would have to lie about my story or use profanity or something like that, so I'm, I'm not going. But you know how it is with your sponsor. I'm, I'm picking up. I ain't going. Yes, you are. So I wind up going. <laughs> Monday night, Humsburg. The prison has since been closed. But Friday night, I realized I definitely can't go, and he would understand why. Because the Eagles are playing the Cowboys Monday night football. He would definitely understand. So I call him up and say, Bobby, I can't go. He said, Bobby, you gave me your word. He said, that's a commitment. Besides, if you pick up a drink, I don't think Randall Cunningham's going to come over and trust up your ass and hang up on me. <laughs> so I went with them, right? And we go, and, and for those who've done prison work, you know, that's a process. You know, you've got to leave your valuables in the car and call your name in advance and all that stuff, right? So we go through the process. I show up. They don't show up. They're all on the block watching the game. <laughs> Now I got an attitude. I'm, I'm coming down 95. I'm trying to get the game on the radio. He wants to talk. I said, please, will you shut I'm trying to get the game here, right? He turned to me. He said, you don't get it yourself. It's SOB. We were here just in case they showed up. We are responsible for the effort, not the outcome. If I want to claim success or re responsibility for all the successes, then I better be willing to step to the plate and accept responsibility for all my failures. And my experience, my failures far outnumber the successes. And you know what? I'm not willing to do that because I'm not responsible for that. It's God. I carry the message of the same. I, I, so, I sponsor a number of men. I give them the same message. Now, I sponsor each guy a little bit differently because I get some guys who are not so bright and I get some guys with some formal education. I give them the same message. I just try just a little delivery, just a little different slant. But it's the same message. I'm not shortcutting anybody, you know. The guy down, guy lived across the street from me as a kid. His name was Joe. Joe had a, a bar at the end of the street. It was a dump. It really was. In fact, if you came in the bar, you said, where is this toilet? I said, you're standing in it. 
Joe was a pretty rough dude, and towards the end of my drinking, Joe used some colorful language to tell me that I was no longer welcome in the dump of the bar that he owned. He said, Bobby, I know what you do for a living. I know your family. I don't care. You're not allowed in my bar. And he used some colorful language to let me know what he would do to me if I showed up. A few years before that, Joe's brother was coming back from Atlantic City, him and his sister-in-law, and uh, they were killed in an automobile accident. Joe had four kids, his brother had five, and Joe took these kids in. To me, that's a definition of a man. I mean, some guys don't even take care of their own kids, and this guy's bringing in his nephews and nieces and raising them as their own. Just a great dude, right? Now, this is the same guy who used colorful language to threaten me with bodily harm if I came near the dump of his bar. A few years ago, maybe about eight, nine years ago, my father called me up. He said, Bobby, he said, Joe, wants your phone number. Can I give it to him? I said, sure, Dad. Anyone calls, give him my number. No problem. So Joe calls me up. He said, Bobby, you still go to the MAA meetings? I said, yeah, Joe, I do. And he know. In my neighborhood, bad news travels quickly. No one talks about, like, you know, Anthony got promoted, you know, Salvi, you know, they got married. It's all more like, you know, Frankie violated his parole. No one's back in jail. I mean, bad news travels quickly. No one wants to say the good news. He says, I was wondering if you could help my nephew, Jimmy. And Jimmy just got out of treatment. He was 17 years old. His nephew, his son, he raised this guy. Now, here's a guy who threatened me with bodily harm if I came near the dump of a bar he owned. Now he wants me to take his nephew to an AA meeting. Not for him because I was running around the neighborhood telling people I was an AA. He knew. It wasn't what I was saying. It was what I was doing. And I've been taking his, I took his nephew to a meeting. Actually, it's, uh, it's 10 years because uh, Jimmy's now 27. I was at his wedding last year. The dude's sober 10 years. Went back to school. Solid AA member. Now, I had lots of guys. So I carried the message who died. I didn't give them any different message than I gave Jimmy. I gave him the same directions. It was just Jimmy was willing to take the action that the other guys refused to take. So the deal is 12-step work takes many different forms and fashions. I know prisons aren't for everyone, but there's other type of work you can do. There's uh, H&I institutions, whatever you call them down here. You can go to treatment facilities to carry the message. There's uh, public information. You go to public health areas or schools and carry the message. Not your story, the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's CPC. That's not PCP. That's CPC, Cooperation with Professional Community, where you would take a student, whether they be a nursing student, medical student, or a divinity student, you take them to an open AA meeting. So for one day when they're practicing their, uh, their profession, they may make a referral to Alcoholics Anonymous. They have some, more, some more idea what AA is about. I am a firm believer that every person sitting here has a gift. It may be different than, than the person sitting next to you, but it's your gift. You need to find out what it is, you know? Finished up with this. I spoke a little bit long. I appreciate you being patient. I was in Mexico about 17, 18 years ago. Now, I worked in the barrio for many years in Philadelphia. And uh, my Spanish consisted of Dame Pistola, which means give me your gun. And I thought I could speak Spanish. So I'm at this meeting. I'm the only English-speaking person in the room in this meeting in Mexico. And then I can tell by the baffled look in these people's face, they didn't understand what I was saying. So I switched over to English. And they still didn't know what the hell I was saying. At the end of the meeting, they came up and they hugged me. And I can tell who the old-timer was by the strain in their face. And I can, tell who, I can tell who the new guy was by their pain in their face. They may not have understood, but you know what? They understood. Language of the heart, you know. 1993, I was the alternate delegate to the General Service Assembly. I wanted to be the youngest delegate ever to the conference. Who that delegate was, how old they were, I had no idea it was going to be me. I, got, I was training, to, I wanted to do the Boston Marathon. And to, to run uh, Boston, you have and do the Marine Corps Marathon, right? And uh, one day I took a stumble. I'm not the most grateful guy, uh, graceful guy, but I hurt my shoulder. Things were out of whack. I was showing my stride off, so I went to go to the doctor to get it checked out. There was a tumor pressing against my lung. It was lung cancer. It wasn't my fault. So I went to get a second opinion. I got confirmed with the lung cancer. I never smoked in my life. A little reefer for a short period of time, but that don't count. But I never smoked a cigarette in my life. So I went to a treatment, and I came out, and I bounced back and did pretty good. And then I really got sick, really sick, where they actually eventually had to remove the lower left lobe of my lung. Now, I'm a meeting maker. 1,600 meetings a week, no reason not to make meetings. I've always made meetings. Some of my best meetings, you know, midnight meetings. I'm telling you, midnight meetings, they're, they're the best. I mean, you got the dudes who work in second shift trying to stay sober, and you got the dudes with the capes and the ray guns. I mean, nothing, nothing like a midnight meeting, man. It's... The witch now. You would have up to New York, Times Square, Midnight Madness, in the, uh, like uh, actually in the village. Midnight Madness, it's just awesome, powerful stuff. So here I am. I'm in the hospital for a while. And I don't know when you think I handled this well because I didn't. I'm sober for a while. I'm in my 30s. I think I'm going places. I got things to do. I didn't handle this well. And my sponsor, Troubles, who took me through the steps, 
who two years later would be dead of lung cancer. He had not been diagnosed yet. He said, Bobby, what are you going to do about this? So I went through a treatment, and then I, get, I was in the hospital. I was laid up, and then when I got out of the hospital, I was in my house for a bit, and I had to resign my position. I knew I couldn't do it, you know. And people start coming to my house. I'm just not talking about my friends. I'm talking about people I may have made once, met once or twice, or people I didn't even know that a friend of mine, a friend of mine was bringing a stranger to my house to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. You're looking at a liar, thief, and a cheat. I took from everyone. The only thing I gave was heartache and misery. And people came to my house to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a firm believer that my my doctors did a pretty good job, but I'm a better I'm a firm believer in prayer and prayer work. When I first got diagnosed, I may have an excuse to go out and get loaded, but you know what? I didn't have a reason to go out and get loaded. Because I've been through thousands of meetings, and I saw some men and women go through some terrible things of their own, and they got through it, through no fault of their own. And they got through this without picking up a drink. See, that's what AA promises me. 24 hours at a time, I can get through anything. Just one day at a time, that's all i got to do, it, you know? So I bounced back, and then I got sick again, and, uh, you know, uh, I actually had my full lung removed, uh, not that long ago, back in uh, the end of April, April this year. And so I put on a couple pounds. My hair finally came back. I glow in the dark. But, you know, <laughs> I count my blessings, you know. If you're new, like I said, I, I don't wish you luck. I, I wish you well. I wish you get a sponsor. Make sure your sponsor has done the steps. I always say these controversial remarks for the end because I'll be off the stage in about two minutes. Make sure your sponsor has done the steps. How do you find out? I know, it's a little test. You ask them. He or she will say two things. Yes or no. The person says yes, that's your guy. You know what, Alcoholics Anonymous, I grew up in a neighborhood, it was a very blue-collar neighborhood, the sign of success, very few kids went to get formal education. A lot of kids went to get a union card, whether you're the iron workers, the electricians, you became a cop, a fireman, whatever the deal was. AA is the same thing. You know, when you join the building trades, let's say you become an electrician, you're an apprentice. And one day a week you go to school, four days a week you work a job. And at the end of the four years, you become a journeyman. Alcoholics Anonymous is the same thing. The new guy is the apprentice. You get yourself a journeyman, someone who's experienced the steps. He and she walks you through the steps till you get your experience. You become, an, you become the journeyman, and then you take an apprentice under your wing. It's been working that way since 1935. I'm sure you do the same thing in South Carolina that we do up in South Philadelphia. You know, it's a wonderful way of life. It really is. What what goes on now? Uh, real quick, um, I'm still with the city of Philadelphia. I'm no longer a detective. Uh, I wound up getting stabbed a few years ago. Went back to school. But if you, that's all right, if you got a warrant, please relax. <laughs> you got to take care of that stuff, though, fella. We got computers. Uh, it's not like back in the day we lost paperwork. That don't happen these days. Take care of that stuff. And seriously. Uh, if you turn yourself in, I know there's a lot of fear there, but I'm telling you, when you turn yourself in, you're dealing with a position of strength. If we pull you over and we run you, you're screwed, you know, so good luck with that stuff. <laughs> uh, but I still work in the city. I work in another capacity. I've uh, just had 25 years of service this past July. Uh, what happened to that little kid I ran over? You know, they say God takes care of drunks, fools, and kids. Well, I hit the trifecta that day. The kid wasn't seriously injured, and thank God, because if he did, that would have changed the dynamics of the whole situation. I probably wouldn't be here today. I actually didn't know the kid, but I knew the kid's family. He came from a very large family, too. His, his, he was actually the same age as one of my younger brothers. And I had the opportunity to make amends to that kid, you know. Still never married, no kids, uh, no need to rush into that. I just uh, was just 48 a couple weeks ago and a little over sober 20 years, so I figured I got time for that, you know. What happened to my mom? Uh, my mom died that day, and, you know, when I was in the VA hospital, I was reading a book. It was in non-conference approved literature, and the, and the counselor came up to me, and he told me I shouldn't be reading that. And he said, what's your sobriety date? I says, I don't know. You know, he said, well, if you don't know, you probably don't have one. And I strongly suggest you get one. And I said, all right, Memorial Day was a Monday, and I know, you know, I just tried to figure it out it was late that year, so I just picked the date. I picked June 2nd. I don't know why I just picked that date. Didn't realize the significance of that until June 1st. I knew the next day I was going to celebrate my first anniversary on June 2nd. And June 2nd is my mom's birthday. So I really believe that God may have something to do with that. I was sober four years. I sat down and made amends with my father. My father hugged me. He forgave me, you know. So I can go through that. You can get through anything. 
So again, I'm not the poster boy of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, please keep coming back. Don't quit before the miracle happens. I think what you do here is just beautiful work, man. And uh, I thank you very much for the privilege of participating in the AA meeting. That's all I got. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.